Hello, uh, we're here to talk with uh, Elizabeth Gordon and Jeanette Westbrook. Elizabeth's from the UK and Jeanette's from the United States. And we're going to talk about Jean's blog and, and how it made them feel. So the question is, um, Elizabeth, after you read Jean's blog about patriarchy and the uh, non-state torture war against women and girls, how did you as a survivor of non-state torture feel after reading the blog? Well, I, I feel that it is a war. It's a silencing war. It's a discriminatory war. It's invasive. Um, it's intentional. And I feel very sad um, because I've spent the last 11, 12 years speaking um, and trying to speak about the torture that I survived as a child and naming it and having those ordeals recognized. And yet um, what I see and, and how I, I perceive what's happening in, in the UK and, and certainly if that goes around the world as well, is that torture happens to to women all over the world and has happened for eons. So, but do women feel that they can say that they've been tortured? No, they, they often say, they'll say they've been abused, but actually when I listen to them, I can hear that what, they've, what they're describing is torture, but they haven't got the words for that because, um, our government, our society doesn't recognize torture. Um, I see women using the word torture, like I spoke to a woman last week who was describing being hung up on hooks, being caged, being raped in tunnels, and she's calling it torture, but she doesn't realize that it's a human rights violation. Um, she then goes to abuse because that's the word that everybody else uses. And that for me is the loneliness because I know it's torture, but can I reach out and connect with other women who speak the same language as me? And I can't, and that's a, a social isolation for me um, personally. And it means that when, when you're trying to heal, one of the ways you heal is to make connection with women um, connection in communities and you're understood for having come through a violation or a, a trauma but you can't but at the moment I can't connect unless it's with you or with Philia in the UK um, and that that is very painful and makes me feel very alone mm. um, yeah very powerful and how about you, Jeanette? How, how does the, uh, the blog, reading the blog, make you feel as a survivor of non-state torture? Well, um, having known you all for a long time now, um, to see it written in that, uh, in that format for all of the world to see will make it possible just what Elizabeth said uh, for women to have the language to voice what has happened to them and to not acknowledge or use the right language that is torture and torture that is committed by family members or in the private sphere uh, is in fact another way to violate us because that keeps it invisible. Um, it keeps us silent. Uh, for years, I tried to find something, read something. I've read hundreds and hundreds of books trying to find a description of what I had experienced in torture. Um, you know, being placed in cages, drugged, locked in closets, uh, forced abortion, uh, threats, child pornography, 
all of those things that I had experienced and, and much more on that list. Uh, and I couldn't find it. The closest I came to it was literature of the Holocaust and uh, reading those accounts of the atrocities and the torture. That was state-sponsored torture, but I still wasn't anything I could find that described uh, torture in, in my home by people who were, who were supposed to protect and love me, but in fact were, were perpetrators. And I spent many years uh, trying to escape. And when I did escape, I was just basically on the street where I was subjected to even more trauma. Um, so by seeing the work that Jean and Linda has done, it really prompted me to not only speak, but to become a really strong activist because now I had the tools. I had the language and I had the tools that could be used and it accumulated in a uh, 2007 uh, report to uh, submitted by Yakim, Special Rapporteur to the United, Station, the United Nations and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She was a Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. And she took my report there uh, to Geneva. And so that's what it has meant for me uh, to be able to speak at the highest levels. And you know, prior to that, I took action on prosecuting one of my perpetrators, but even that wasn't enough because at the time there were no words that described torture. There, there weren't even words about human trafficking. Um, there was nothing. So they had to lay charges with existing statutes. These statutes need to fall all across the United States, Canada, and the world. There should be no statutes of limitations on sexualized crimes against women mm. and torture against women. That, if, if we say that we have a United Nations documents and treaty on torture, we cannot ignore our torture women's torture, and we can't ignore what our allies say in support of us survivors. Hmm. And to do so is a human rights violation. Thank you. Certainly is, Jeanette. Well, thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Elizabeth. I'll share how it feels for me to have read um, Jean's blog. And um, it's a relief for me because it's something that Jean and I have known for a long time, how, you know, we had a, a gut feeling that non-state torture was global. We just didn't have all of the pieces to put together, to put on a piece of paper to show people. So it's a relief to have that visual and to have uh, Jean's words out there to really show that tragically, non-state torture is a rampant war against women and girls all around the world. So it's not happening just in the UK or in the US or in Canada or in Europe, it's happening globally to millions and millions of, of women and girls. And it's a very, very serious crime that's been uh, dismissed and invisibilized since time immemorial. And I'm hoping that as we keep moving forward that people will, will get that reality and wanna do something about it. And tragically, if they don't, at least I will know that I've done all I can do to put it out there. You know, we have to get uh, frightened enough of what the world is like for women and girls to really want to say enough is enough. We have to start demanding better for every woman and girl. It can't just be for certain women and girls. So it's, it's a relief for me. And, and I have pride in knowing that I'm part of it. Mm. And what about you, Jean? Well, I was reflecting, um, I'm looking at the monitor and I'm looking at four women and I'm thinking in some way, this must be a breakthrough in reality. That when is it that four women have sat openly knowing this can be shared with others, talking 
about torture perpetrated by private individuals. We're all having the same language. And I don't know if, if either you, Jeanette, or you, Elizabeth, have ever sat with four people like this talking freely about the human right crime of non-state torture. If you haven't, I would like for us to really understand that this is a monumental moment, that this is what's going on here. And that shouldn't, that shouldn't be dismissed because sometimes in patriarchy, it seems we have to work so hard to get at celebrating monumental moments. And I don't want to miss this moment because I think it is monumental. And for the people that um, to understand what the four of us are talking about, I did print off the model. So I just want to show it in case it goes somewhere else. Can you see it OK? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the model we're talking about, the non-state torture war against women and girls. And like Linda said, um, it was a new awareness for us uh, back in 1993. And it's taken 11 years for us to find the terminology non-state actor, non-state actor torture, for society to even grapple with the idea that violence against women and girls in, in private lives even warranted any attention. I mean, that is the ultimate of patriarchy that women and girls are no ones, if you will, they don't count. So what happens to us doesn't matter. So it took Amnesty International for this one issue to put the name of uh, non-state actors out there. That took Linda and I 11 years of work. And then the at 15 years, the UN Committee Against Torture acknowledged that non-state actors do commit uh, crimes that amount to torture. So that's 15 years in our evolution against patriarchy. So now for me, this model, we had to wait 28 years to have the rest of society come in to say, yes, um, women who are prostituted can suffer uh, crimes that amount to torture. You know, children who are trafficked certainly um, suffer crimes that become human right crime that amounts to torture by private individuals. In pornography, child brides, FGM, female genital mutilation, forced labor, slavery, all this knowledge has developed over Linda and my 28 years of work. So I am thrilled to have the model to show. And actually in this model, Linda and I have already expanded it to the women in Papua New Guinea. Uh, Linda and I have a, a friend, Lily in Papua New Guinea. He's working very hard around the tradition of sorcery and torture. So we've already expanded this model into embracing other women. Um, so Linda used the word enough is enough. And that's true. I think we're beyond enough and enough. So I'm hoping that somehow, um, like you said, Jeanette, there aren't very many women who are speaking and you agree, Elizabeth, with your activism, mm -hmm. that together we can push to make sure that um, the silencing, that unsilencing that we're doing is going to have a ripple effect around the world. So that's, that's a hope and a dream. Mm 